Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast. Today we're going to discuss a topic that's close to the hearts of many parents out there. We're diving into the various ways you can help your children enter the property market and help them secure their financial future. So if you're a parent looking to support your kids in buying their first property, or if you're just curious about the various ways to assist the next generation in achieving property success, and particularly if you're interested in getting into the market yourself for the first time, I'm sure my discussion with Ken Race, Director of Metropole Wealth, advisory is going to be valuable to you. He's going to share some insights, some tips to guide you into and and your children into home ownership, ensuring they start the property journey on the right foot. Now, before we get started, I also want to tell you about another podcast that I'm now going to be producing every week with leading demographer Simon Kirstenmacher. It's Demographics Decoded, a new podcast to help unveil the trends that are going to shape your future, especially if you're interested in property and particularly if you're a business owner. So wherever you're listening to this podcast, just go, there's already just a preview episode there look for demographics decoded i'll leave a link in the show notes and subscribe to that because that's a different subscription but a weekly chat and if you've heard my simon kirstenmacher podcasts on this show you'll know how much valuable information we're going to be able to share with you so we're going to get on with the show now but first stop for a sec and subscribe to demographics decoded Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's authority in wealth creation through property, who has been voted one of Australia's top 50 most influential thought leaders. Housing affordability is the current topic of conversation at dinner tables across Australia. And for families with children in particular, it's probably a discussion based around how they'll struggle to ever buy their own home. Rising interest rates, tougher lending conditions, sky-high property prices have kept pushing up the amount needed for a deposit faster than most people's capacity to save. Now, I'm sure you've heard it said that the bank of mum and dad's playing a major factor in shaping our housing markets. So I've asked Ken Race, Director of Metropole Wealth Advisory, to share some of his thoughts about this important topic with us. Hi, Ken. Hi, Michael. Hi, listeners. Well, you know, we've both got kids and we've got grandkids, so this isn't just talking from theory, is it, Ken? I certainly had to do it with my four children. Can I say the proof is in the pudding? Well, interestingly, if I think back, my first investment way back in the early 1970s was actually an investment before I bought my home. I bought two investment properties before I I got married. I went halves with my parents with the bank of mum and dad. We borrowed $1,000 each, which was, well, I didn't. I saved up, they saved up $1,000 and this is how then we borrowed $16,000 and boy, that seemed like a lot of money at the time. But today... Some people got uh, very fortunate they got parents that could be in the position to buy their children a home outright, but that's really very rare. That's the exception. Yet all parents are likely to cast a cautious eye over the headlines as they think, well, how are my children ever going to get into the market? Now, I remember in the 80s, there were the headlines, Ken, our children will never be able to afford a property. Property values can't keep going up again. I'm sure you remember those times too. So this is nothing new. These discussions have been around for a long time, Ken. That's right. The big difference between, can I say, then and now is interest rates. So while, can I say, the weekly payments, the monthly payments are one thing, it's saving up for that deposit. It's more the deposit, isn't it, rather than servicing the debt, which is the challenge a lot of people have, because in those days, interest rates were higher. But uh, I guess it's rising property values, the cost of living means that you've got to uh, pay more for your rent and for petrol and for other things. So it really is the deposit. And I guess that's meaning that some people are staying at home a little bit longer. But let's talk about the various ways that parents can help their kids children into the property market. Again, even if you're not a parent, if you're listening to this, you're wondering how you can get into the market. I'm sure the discussion Ken and I are going to have will give you some hints. So let's talk about the first way. I guess the first way is just give your kids some money, Ken. Would that be one way? That's right. So if you're lucky enough that you've got those uh, funds, I mean, lots of kids are hoping they'll inherit it, but for many that's too late. 
it's almost inherited for the grandchildren to buy their home, but that's a different topic. So yeah, they can give them the money, no strings attached. There's normally no tax implications, of course. Well, you've got to pay it after after tax money, though, don't you? So the the parents have to pay the tax, <laughs> and then they lose the income generation from that money, which could impact their lifestyle. If they're on a Centrelink uh, payment, you've got to be very careful. It's seen as a gift, and there's limits of how much you can do there. So there's all those restrictions, and you've you've really got to look at. For most parents, they just don't have that amount of money. So how can they help their kids? And it might be you save some, we'll put some money in. But then that's got broader ramifications. Do you do it for one child or in my case, four children? What happens when you pass away? So you've got to take all that into account. So for a lot of people, that's not as practical. But if you're lucky enough to be in that situation then uh, gift the money. You've just got to be very careful when the kids are borrowing that the bank actually sees that amount as a deposit on their behalf as opposed to a gift and not treat it as a deposit and therefore be much more restrictive on the loan. Sure. Well, many banks still want to see a good saving record, don't they? Sometimes it's worth, rather than going directly to a bank, have a good mortgage broker with a we tend to use a a number of those at Metropole to help them navigate the right lending options. Some lenders don't allow gifts as a deposit. As you said, it could cause Centrelink problems. I guess the other thing is if you give it early, you've got to also do your own numbers and sums and make sure that it's not going to impact on your own lifestyle and retirement income. I guess the big risk from that though, Ken, and this flows through to some of the other things I bet we're going to talk about as well, is if you give it to your child It becomes part of the pool for your children, your child and their spouse. What happens if a relationship breaks down? Now, I remember in the old days I used to, when I sat with clients, say, oh, in my blended family I've got six kids, which means that on the statistics two or three of them are going to get divorced and I don't know who they are, ha-ha. Well, unfortunately now I do know who they are. So this is the reality of life, isn't it? That's right. So I always advise my clients that they should do it via a loan. But again, that's got implications on the child borrowing money if the bank sees it as a loan. So you've got to talk to your broker. And I'd put it in as a loan, interest free, payable on demand. But then you've got to make sure you do the paperwork uh, correctly because we've all seen Judge Judy and those sorts of shows. Was it a gift or was it a loan? There's statute of limitations uh, restrictions that after a certain number of years, Even if you lent money to somebody, if there wasn't a payback schedule that was actually being paid, then the courts would deem it as a gift. So you've got to have proper paperwork, but you've got to keep that up to date. So what you're saying is even if you have no intention of your child repaying the debt, a loan agreement gives you the option and and protects you. uh, In case something happens. Yes, yes. yes, In case something happens in the relationship that your child has with that other person. Now, some people are going to say, oh, I don't want to. I trust my children. I don't feel comfortable getting uh, our children to sign a loan contract but I think you should consider it as protection for the family if they divorce or if they have business troubles, even if they don't divorce and get into financial troubles, the family should be able to get the money back before assets are sold or divvied up by other people. Correct. And I know we lent a little bit of money to one of our children and he actually wanted to formalise it because he thought it would be unfair to his three other brothers and sisters if he was seen to get money that could have been free. But that was his way of looking at it. But you've got to consider the other children if you've got other children. So I agree with you that in principle, I'd rather give a loan than a gift because it gives you more options. What do the banks think about that, Ken? If you give it as a loan, in a lot of instances, the bank would actually see it now being a 100% loan. And then for, say, if I'm going to lend you 80 and you've borrowed 20%, that's a 100% loan, they might knock you back. So you've got to work very closely with your uh, mortgage strategist to actually create the story and the scenario of why this can be seen as money from the parents, which still allows the bank to do their normal loan. And that, that requires a conversation 
and a conversation with a strategist who understands what is uh, actually happening as opposed to, you know, the, the home lending manager at the local branch. And, of course, the banks are still going to want to make sure that the borrower, your children, are going to be able to service the loan and they'd love to see a, a savings record along the way, which, by the way, I think I'd be wanting my kids to always have as well so that they should have the financial discipline. Just giving them money without the background financial discipline is almost a recipe for disaster, Ken. Correct, because it, it puts them on a good stead for in the future. And you know, saving for holidays, do we spend money on this or that? Uh, how do I buy the next car? Holidays. So I think a good savings strategy and a mentality is one of those lifelong gifts that we give our children. Sure. Well, as I've often said, it's not what you leave them, it's what you leave in them. So I think along the way, financial education is important. Uh, financial literacy isn't taught at schools. That's why you write your blogs and I do and why we do the podcast to educate people. And so I think encouraging savings and investing, saving up a deposit. And as you said just a moment ago, even just matching it in some ways, okay, you save a thousand dollars, I'll give you, it doesn't have to be exactly the same amount. You can give more or whatever. That works nicely. So two ways of doing, helping your kids by giving them some money to get a deposit to get going is giving them money, lending them money. But there are other methods as well. What other ways yeah. can one do it? So a lot of parents co-guarantee that loan and that allows that child to borrow money as well as in the guarantee and the loan and the uh, gifting. The other benefits of that is a bank might still see it that they're lending you 80% if you've picked up 20% in another manner, which means that you go below that, that loan to valuation ratio that requires lenders mortgage insurance. There's a big incentive for that because lenders mortgage insurance, and uh, I'm going to say is around the 2.5% of the gross value of the property you purchase. So a million dollar property, it's $25,000 mortgage insurance that can be saved. So there's definitely benefits for that. But if you guarantee, you've got to be very careful because normally the banks would say, mum and dad, if you've guaranteed it, you actually guarantee the full amount. Yes. You're joint and severally liable. Most people don't realise that, which also would have the implication that it will limit your own personal borrowing capacity, Ken. Correct. And if you've actually borrowed that money off a line of credit or that sort of thing against your home, the bank normally, if they have to repossess or, or uh, make a claim on a loan, go after the easiest asset. And if that happens to be the parent's home, that puts that home in jeopardy. So for me, I like to restrict, if, if you like, a guarantee to only the specific amount of money that the child needs to be able to get that loan. So what you're saying, Ken, is it's not a personal guarantee as much as you're giving security to the bank, aren't you, by them taking... For a fixed amount. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, Ken, what you're suggesting is that one way of giving the family guarantee is giving the bank access to equity in your property by taking a loan over your current home or other investments. Would that be right? They take your property as security. Correct. And you limit that to a certain dollar value. So if your child needs an extra 200000 to be able to buy their dream home, and that's a different topic, <laughs> don't get me started about what property uh, the child should buy, limit it to just that amount of money. Okay. We're going to offend somebody by saying that you shouldn't be expecting when you first start off to have the sort of home it took your parents 30 or 40 years to that's eventually right. buy. <laughs> but that's okay. That's a different argument. That's a podcast in itself. Yes. So there's no tax implications in this, are there? No. But there are some risks, as you've already outlined. You're liable for the loan, so you've got to be comfortable that your children can afford not just the property, but that they're responsible with money and that they can repay the debt. Correct. And there are some strategies that parents can put in place, like caveats if they've lent money. Again, you've got to get bank approval for that. It can only be triggered under certain circumstances. And then that means if, if the unlikely situation occurs where you have to call that money back, 
you're you're actually uh, got a safer way of doing that. Okay, so the risks really are in that case that if your kids can't keep up the repayments or they fall behind, you could get into trouble. So I think it's also important to, to have a discussion with your children at the beginning about what you would do if they did get into trouble and the fact could be that they'd even have to sell their home. Now, you wouldn't see many parents doing that, but you've got to have a, a strategy in place. Similarly, I think there should be a strategy in place that if they manage to keep up the repayments and the property value goes up, that maybe the debt can be reduced and eventually the mortgage on your own property will be removed as they have the ability to refinance you out. Correct. And something from left field, and we've helped a number of clients do this, is instead of uh, selling that property, move out, put a tenant in there and go and rent a similar property. And there's actually a financial advantage in doing that because the interest then becomes tax deductible on that, on what was your home. The insurances, all that becomes tax deductible. For a lot of people, they can actually rent a property in this current environment cheaper than they can buy it. So it's really a form of rent vesting, isn't it? Correct. So cash flow is the same. You pay rent out, but somebody gives you rent in, but all of a sudden your expenses become tax deductible. Correct. And then that keeps the wolf away from the doors uh, in case you have to sell. You can wait to a better time in the uh, property cycle and it gives you time to rebreathe, regather, and then maybe move back in. And people might need that strategy if they lose their job, so there's many reasons why people could move themselves into a position of potential default. Now, a moment ago, you mentioned that you give advice on these sort of matters. Metropole Wealth Advisory doesn't just give tax and structuring advice. And I think when things go wrong, people start to think emotionally, make emotional decisions. That's understandable. We're human. But sometimes it helps having somebody on your side, seeing your blind spots uh, and giving you other strategies. So apart from giving advice on this, which is not the main focus of Metropole Wealth Advisory, before we go into some of the other ways we can help our children, what else do you and your team do? We give our clients a complete picture of what they need to um, grow, protect and pass on their wealth. Uh, some people call it a holistic approach. So it's a complete. That means we look at many different aspects of that equation, the tax, the accounting, the use of structures or trusts, asset protection, risk mitigation, cash flow management, the estate planning. So that allows us to identify the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle and make sure they fit together to actually leverage the same as you're doing when you're borrowing money, you're leveraging and uh, you leverage all the um, inputs to get a better outcome because we often see clients who come to us who said, I listened to my accountant or my lawyer or my financial planner and then when I went to the next profession, I got a completely different story. You know, which one's right? Well, potentially they're all right, but when you try and work them into one solution, that's when you get a non-beneficial or a non-maximizing of uh, the results. So you've got to see how the whole picture comes together. Well, I'll leave a link in the show notes for Metropole Wealth Advisory. If you're interested in getting Ken and his team to talk about the right ownership structures, the right business structures, or how to use the tax strategies that the wealthy people do to legally minimise your tax and help you grow, protect and pass on your wealth, I'd love you to catch up with Ken and his team. Now, Ken, some people would say, but why doesn't my accountant or why can't my accountant help me with this? I learned something really interesting. I'm still learning every day. That's one of my aims at Wealth Retreat a while ago where we were talking and somebody pointed out that the accountant's client is actually the tax department. That didn't make sense to me. But I realised after speaking with a few people that there's this data matching service and the accountants are very beholden to not uh, stepping out of line with what other people are doing. And if all of a sudden their clients are claiming more car expenses or different expenses than the average, the tax department, the ATO with their data matching service, taps them on the shoulder and asks why. So of course the client is still the client, but their, one of their main focuses is on just making sure the tax 
gets paid properly rather than all the other areas that you look at. Correct. It's compliance work. And that, at the end of the day, is what you're paying most accountants to do. So we're now taking it up a notch. And what are the strategic inputs that you need to make um, long-term investment-grade decisions? Okay. Well, we were talking about how to help our children enter the property market in these challenging times. We discussed giving them money not the best idea. Lending them money makes more sense. If you haven't got the money to lend them, offering a family guarantee. I guess some people, like the first time I got involved, uh, my parents went halves with me in a, in the property and it happened to work out nicely. I guess we were what we call tenants in common. Uh, we had, I owned half, they owned half. And interestingly, when I got married, I actually sold out that uh, uh, my half share to my parents. It worked for me at the time. And interestingly, you know the story, Ken, uh, Pam and I bought that back uh, from my mother many, many years later. So I still own the first property I invested in, uh, but I've built two townhouses since. Do you find many parents buying properties Would you rec- together with their kids? Would you recommend that as a strategy? Look, I think for a few people that works. Uh, for a lot, it's a good idea but I think it doesn't work at the, in, at the end. But you mentioned an interesting word. You said bias tenants in common. And maybe for our audience, what tenants in common means is each party owns their individual component, whatever percentage. And that means if they die, it goes into their estate and then through their will. Don't buy as joint tenants. So joint tenants is a typical way um, spouses would buy. So when one spouse dies, the other spouse automatically picks up that portion, obviously after showing a death certificate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you want to have the, the ability that if you buy with your children, if you die, then you decide whether it goes into the estate, whether it goes to your child. So tenants in common is the way to buy it. And depending on the person percentage, You then have to also consider if the child is going to live in it as a home, then that main residence exemption, and by that I mean if you sell a a home that you've lived in, you don't pay capital gains tax. That only applies to the percentage for the person living in the property. So if a parent buys 50-50, then that 50% that the parent has, if they're not living in the home, of course, is just an investment. So if the property gets sold, normal capital gains tax for their half. The other thing is there's a minimum percentage the child has to own if you want the land tax exemption, because typically on a a family home, you don't pay land tax, but uh, the child has to own or the person living in it as a home has to own a minimum amount. And that's different for every state. Yes, land tax being a state-based tax. I guess what I was about to say is that you've really got to have some serious discussions beforehand and document it correctly like you would document a loan. In other words, is the intention for your child to buy you out in the future or are the two of you going to sell it off and share the proceeds? Remember, though, if that's happening, if you both own it, you both names on title, you're in, generally you're fully liable for the full amount of the loan, which has got implications for both parties with regard to serviceability for future loans. If you want to buy more investments, uh, the bank still sees it like you could be if the other party, your children are not able to keep up the loans, you're responsible for the full debt. And same with your kids if they want to do other things. And as you say, you're liable for capital gains tax. I guess you've got to also be careful about what would happen if there's a relationship breakdown as well. So there's lots of things to think about and I guess best to document. But there is the bank and mum and dad helping a lot. In fact, uh, there's various uh, estimates that now it's the fifth biggest lender. In- interestingly, it's creating a group of haves and have-nots. It's helping some people get into the market because they've got the parents who got the money and others not. And and that's a bit of a shame. But I think it's one of the things that's kept pushing our property markets up at the moment, isn't it? Yeah. One of the things that uh, I think about sometimes is the parents are willing to to help their child because the child's been living in the home until they're 35 or Uh, or something. So uh, it's revenge of the parents. But jokes aside, 
uh, as you say, it's probably the fifth biggest lender, but you've got to document it. You've got to, from day one, understand what happens if the proverbial hits the fan. Sorry if I've offended anyone. An exit strategy and plan for these things and hope they don't occur. But plan for them. As you've mentioned, Michael, uh, normally when you borrow, both parties would be liable for 100% of the loan because the bank can go to either party. And that means that you, on your balance sheet, if you if you like, on your net wealth, it shows 100% debt, but only 50% of the property. That's why it reduces your borrowing capacity. So be very careful if um, the parent wants to maintain a investment strategy moving forward that this would impact on their um, borrowing capacity. Well, various reports have suggested that up to 40% of first home buyers are now using the bank of mum and dad to get them into the market. That's what the, the latest domain first home buyer report, repeat, which came out a short while ago, suggested. That's a very large percentage. I think the theme of what we're discussing is get advice before you do this. Be careful because, uh, again, we're all emotional about our kids. We want to help our kids and I know you have, I have in, in various ways. There are other ways of doing it as well that I know you and your team advise parents to do but we won't get into that a, a, at the moment. Any other thoughts or suggestions while we're discussing this, Ken? Look, I think we should look at the various government assistance programs particularly for first home buyers. And there's different grants for whether you're buying a new property or an existing property at the state level. There's also the super saver account. So while I'm not giving you financial planning advice, normally when you save up money for a deposit, it's your after-tax money and you would have uh, paid your marginal tax rate on that. But legislation's now in place that you can save through your superannuation and therefore your super is only taxed at 15%, where you might be at a much higher rate. So you're actually picking up the tax differential. You've just got to be careful on, uh, it can only come out to be used as a, for your home. There's maximum amounts you can put in there. And if you don't end up buying a home, and you can therefore withdraw that money, then uh, there's taxes to be paid uh, on the earnings that you would have had an advantage of. So you've got to talk to your superannuation fund because that's a specific way they set that up. So if you take all those things into account, there's also uh, stamp duty concessions that are available and they can all add up to many, many, many tens of thousands of dollars, which uh, can make a, a big difference. So understand all that. For me, it's save, save, save. And you save before you spend. That's the big lesson for the for your children. Get a job, <laughs> uh, even while you're at school. And yes, it might impact uh, the amount of time you spend studying. But that aside, take out the amount you want to save before you say, how much do I have to spend? And then that's a good start in life. So interestingly, Ken, when we look at the, the amount of money that the bank of mum and dad have injected into the housing markets, uh, one doesn't know completely, but the suggestion is that last year was about $2.7 billion, which is a huge amount. And on average, the loans were just under $100,000, lending a little bit more in New South Wales uh, parents in New South Wales than in Victoria, and I guess that's got to do with property values. But interestingly, it's not just housing that the Bank of Mum and Dad's been helping people with. According to some recent research, 65% of 18 to 19-year-olds have actually had some direct family support. About 43% of people in the early 20s, and as they get older, a little bit less, but even kids in their 30s, 15.5% of children, or well, they're not children anymore, adults in their 30s are getting various support, not just houses, but other expense categories as they're having challenges at the moment, Ken. That's right. It could be, as you say, with those sums, it's just enough to edge you into, can I say, that next um, level of property, you know, a two-bedder instead of a one-bedder. 
you know, closer to transport versus a, a long way away from transport. So take all that into account. Can I say get all the free money you can get <laughs> from the government as opposed to your parents? And there's quite a number of schemes there. One of the other things that we've uh, worked with clients is they've bought the property for their, can I say, young child to have when the child gets older. So they're pre-buying the home, if you like. You've got to be very careful there. Do you have it in, in your name, the parent's name, and then have the, the potential capital gains tax and stamp duty when you move it over? Do you put it in the young child's name? And if you do, you've got to be very careful because there's very punitive tax rates for children under 18 who haven't physically worked for the money. And there's different ways to get around each of those problems. But again, seek the advice and make it specific for your circumstances and open your mind to maybe looking at things slightly differently to get to the same outcome. I think that's great advice. Of course, we often hear people say, look, my children are going to go to university. I better buy something close to the university or some student accommodation. I've often thought that trying to make a property have two jobs, be a holiday home plus a good investment, be student accommodation or where your kids are going to want to live and be a good long-term investment is often asking too much of the property. So again, rather than being emotional, get advice and understand what's the best way of achieving a result. So again, if you want advice, the team at Metropole would love to help you. If you're looking for more structuring or tax or superannuation advice, the team at Metropole Wealth Advisory can help you as well. Ken, thank you very much. I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more about the bank of mum and dad in future years. I'm sure we will. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, listeners. Ken Race always has great information, doesn't he? If you've enjoyed this, but you don't currently subscribe or follow the show, whether you're listening to it on a podcast app or YouTube, just stop for a second, click the subscribe button so twice a week we're going to be able to give you valuable information. And at the beginning of the show, I also mentioned the new podcast I'm now going to be producing weekly with demographer Simon Kirstenmacher, Demographics Decoded. Please just do a quick search for that on your podcast app and subscribe to that because he's got some great information. I know what we're planning to discuss, some interesting things about the, the trends that are going to shape our futures that you're going to need to understand as a property investor, business owner or entrepreneur. Subscribe to the Demographics Decoded podcast. I'll leave some links in the show notes for you for that as well. Now, you heard a bit about Ken and Metropole Wealth Advisory. Ken's recognised as one of Australia's leading experts in property tax, structuring and asset protection. Now, that's a mouthful, but Ken's got the run on the board and you can take advantage of his experience and have him as part of your team. Why not get the peace of mind that your financial affairs are coordinated by a single trusted advisor supported by a team of experts in their own fields? Go to metropole.com.au and just leave us your details and let's have a chat with you and see how Ken and his team at Metropole Wealth Advisory could help you. And Of course, we'd love to help you with your property discussions as well. Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. In my mindset message today, I'd like to point out that negative thinking is bad for your health. According to various studies and research findings, humans are their own worst enemy when it comes to how we think. The publication Psychology Today reported that 70% of our thoughts are negative. Really? Well, I guess some people are like that. In 2005, that was a while ago, the National Science Foundation did some research on how humans think. They found that humans had about 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts per day. And of those thoughts, they came up with the fact that 80% were negative. Even worse, they found that 95% of the thoughts we have today were exactly the same thoughts as we had yesterday. And if you think about that, that's true. Oftentimes the thoughts that we think are negative and they cause us to worry, and this leads to stress, which leads to a rise in the hormone cortisol. Excessive and continued production of this impairs our immune system and apparently opens the door for disease and infections. Now, 
Have you had negative thoughts? What have you been thinking about the economy, uh, the environment, the political issues? There's so much in the news that's always negative, pointing to the negative side of things. Every day I see people interacting on social media about things that are outside their control. Some of those reactions get heated and it's clear that it's causing them some stress. But the media knows this. It knows react more to negative news than positive news. So they force feed us negative news just to get the clicks. There's virtually nothing you can do about most of the negative things that you read about or you think about. When you read or think about negative things that you can't control, it leads to long-term stress because you can't change the outcome of those negative things. Those thoughts will be repeated inside your brain over and over again. And as I said, this for many people causes long-term stress. You should only be thinking about things you can control in your life. Focus only on thoughts about things in your life that you've got control over. You've heard me say it before. I want you to be the pilot of your life in control rather than the passenger where you feel you're being dragged along. Why? Because you can take action on certain things. You can fix what needs to be fixed. And then you just move on allowing the other thoughts to go away. So my suggestion to you in this mindset message is stop thinking about things you can't control. It's a waste of your time and it's bad for your health. Well, thanks for spending the last little while with me and I hope you got some benefit from this show. If you did, and you know somebody else who'd also benefit, please tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. There's a share button on every podcast app. On Apple Podcasts, there's three little buttons down the bottom, press it and share it. Or just tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. I hope you're going to be doing them a favour, and you'll definitely be doing me a favour and helping me in my quest to make as many people as possible financially literate. Now, there's ways of catching up with me between these shows. Just look for Michael Yardney on social media, or why not join my private Facebook group? Go to Facebook and look for the Property Update Facebook group. And I have a way of saying thank you to you for subscribing to this podcast. Go to podcastbonus.com.au. There'll be a link in the show notes, podcastbonus.com.au, where you can get a bunch of ebooks and reports. My way of saying thank you. And when you've got time, why not listen to some of the old podcasts? There's individual lessons in each of those that I think would be helpful for you. I'll be back again real soon. In the meantime, have a great week. Make it a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney Podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you?